Hello, everyone. Uh, as Maria said, my name is Tina. I am a research associate at the Archaeology at Tuley Springs Fossil Bin National Monument. So let's get into it. This is the archaeology that we know of. Work. Yeah. So a little bit of an overview. We're gonna, I'm going to go over the establishment of the park, the history of the monument, the big dig, and the research that was done during and after the big dig, the types of archaeological sites are, that are found at Tuley Springs, my work, and what is done at the monument today. So for the establishment of Tuley Springs, uh, the protectors of Tuley Springs is a nonprofit friends group that became aware in, the two, in 2006 about the resources and the cultural and natural resources at the Upper Las Vegas Valley Wash. They started an eight year battle to try to preserve this area because as we'll see shortly, what's actually there. They became a nonprofit and most of the profits that they do get come to us and they help us with funding and projects and all kinds of fun stuff. And because of their efforts, Tuley Springs became a national monument in 2004, 2014, excuse me. So the establishment, it's the 405th unit of the National Park Service. It was established December 19, 2014. It's 2,200 acres, 22 units, the north and the south. There is a power line corridor between the two. And this one may contain paleo, 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 paleo uh, can't talk, sorry, excuse me. Paleo elements, prehistoric elements, historic, rare and threatened wildlife and plants. So it's very interesting. Here's a quick map of the monument. See the north unit is on the top, it's the biggest unit. It's surrounded by Nellis Air Force Base, BLM land and the Desert National Ref Wildlife Refuge. The south unit is where the big dig took place in the section at the bottom where there's a hashtag that's where the big dig and that's part of the national registry uh, list, preservation list. So the history. Uh, it's not on here, but before this, um, in 1930, there was a, there were quarry workers who were just digging and they found bones of a baby mammoth that they named Tuli. Because of this, it spurred research with Mark Harrington, who some of you may know as being the archeologist at Gypsum Cave, as well as Lost City. He found two bone piles and possible charcoal and modified bones, at least what he thought was modified bone tools. Finley Hunter came out with a bunch of the people and found uh, an obsidian flake that was supposedly in situ in the same layer as some Pleistocene animal bones. Then after the development of radio dating by Dr. Libby, they became interested in this area because Mark Harrington came up with a theory that it was possibly one of the first early man sites who had um, contact with Pleistocene megafauna. So before the big dig, Mark Harrington's survey, uh, 1933, he took, this is the de development of his theory, he took the charcoal that he found to Dr. Libby and the radio carbons came back to 28,000 years before present, which was a lot earlier than we thought than we thought that people were here in general before the last ice age maximum. Though they found no uh, lithics at this time, Mark Harrington believed that he found some wooden tools that possibly those wooden tools you'll use because they didn't survive, as well as just hearths that he assumed were hearths that they were probably cooking with. The field work here had 31 localities that were mapped and tested, and all the samples were saved to be um, radio accommodated for later. So the big dig, this is the Tuley Springs expedition. This was a huge, huge, huge project. It was one of the first large scale projects of its time. It was to test whether or not the humans and extinct Pleistocene animals even exist together at Tuley Springs. It brought together geologists, paleontologists, pa uh, pollenologists, which they study ancient pollen, pollen, archaeologists, and a whole lot more people. They dug over two miles of trenches. 
about 12 feet wide and 30 feet deep. Bulldozers would use, rotaries. It was a huge large scale project that probably will never be repeated again in the future. It was also the first large scale use of radiocarbon dating of it to begin with. They were doing weekly radiocarbon testing on what they were finding in these trenches. Here's some pictures from the Big Dig. We have Vance Haynes, who's a geologist who did all the stratigraphy mapping of the trenches. This is an archeologist uh, who is shoveling. You see on the far right of the screen, there is the bulldo bulldo bulldozers that they use to cut the trenches. Tule Springs today, and you can see an area view of the trenches that were dug for this expedition. Quite large scale. So was all this effort worth it? Unfortunately, the radiocarbon dating, the charcoal was actually figured out to not be charcoal. It was organic mat. It was organic material that had oxidized when the springs were still active. So not charcoal. So the dates that were collected were not for humans. It was just organic material when the springs were still active. So as far as we know right now, there is no proof of interaction between humans and Pleistocene megafauna at this time at the springs. The trenches did come up with hundreds of fossils, some of the best examples of mammoth and dire wolf, saber-toothed cat, American lion, uh, camelids, all kinds of animals here. But it gave a lot of information about the data from the paleo environment of Las Vegas since the last ice age. And it gave a good idea of the geological formation of the valley. So yes, the answer, the answer is yes, it was worth it. We know more than we previously did. It drew more attention to the valley opening interest at the nearby Quinn Creek, which there is a open habitation site at Quinn Creek somewhere. Sediment, when the uh, sediment deposits were exposed and uh, analyzed, the Pleistocene water source is from groundwater sources. You can actually find modern al analogies at Quinn Creek or Ash Meadows. That's, if you go there, that's what Las Vegas used to look like during the last ice age. So after, uh, around the same time as the Big Dig, a little bit after, Margaret Sousa, or Lin Margaret Linus as most, of us, most people know, conducted a six feet ground survey at Tooling Springs. They were looking for tools, uh, stone tools that were associated with megafauna. They found over 250 artifacts and of a variety of sorts, limestone, obsidian, quartz, chert, and sandstone. These are some of the, uh, these are not the exact uh, particular points that were found, but these are examples of some that were found. This is of the Elko, ser Elko series. We have a side notch on the far left. The next one is a corner notch, an eared, and then a split stem. Gypsum Cave and Mojave. Gypsum Cave is the bottom one, Mojave Lake is the top one. Pinto series, we have a shoulderless, sloping shoulder, a barbed shoulder, and a square shoulder. And the Humboldt series, quite a few of these. Basal notch, triple T, constricted base, a normal Humboldt, and an expanding base. There was also scrapers and drill sound. Cores, flakes, and hammerstones. Hammerstones were used to strike flakes off of cores to make scrapers and projectile points and anything they needed. And here we have gravers, monos, and matates, hand, hand, grinding, hand and grinding platforms, knives or blades. A knife is different than a projectile point or a biface because it's twice as long as it is wide, at least. Gravers were used to make holes into things like leather. So this is broken down to the type of lithics that were found during this survey. Projectile points, scrapers, disc choppers, knives, drills, a whole variety of different types that were found during her ground survey. It's quite exciting. These are actual pictures from her report of ones that she found. We have projectile points here on plate three and four. We have Elko and we have Pintos. We have some more here. There's some uh, monos and a uh, chopper to the right and bifaces, flakes and drills to the left. 
so the conclusion, her survey was six weeks. She documented, collected, and photographed everything that she found. And it was hard for her to figure out if the assemblages were just brief periods of occupation or a continuous occupation, especially because a lot of the points do not overlap all that close to years. The Pintos is kind of a catch-all, the Elkos, Gypsum. It was just, it's kind of all over the place when it comes to dating of these points. Some of the lab, some don't. With her, um, what she concluded was that the time frames of the diagnostic points do not line up, meaning for her, meaning that the occupation was not permanent but sporadic. Like they were using the springs as a stopping point between uh, where they were going for hunting or different places where they were staying, different habitation sites. She concluded that it was not a complete assemblage, that it was, as I established, it's not complete, it was just sporadic. And most of these projectile points and lithics were not found in the same deposits as the megafauna. Some more data saying that, no, they didn't coexist. And because of the, uh, because of the, how the soil is at Tule Springs, it's very alluvial, it's a floodplain. So they get moved around in different layers. So they look like they have mixed with plexus animals, like the, the layers change because of the water and the wind. So that's why it was originally thought that they were in the same strata as the Pleistocene fossils because it got moved because of wind and water. And another, uh, well, Sousa's, Conclusion along with uh, Vance Haynes, the hearse were not hearse. They were oxidized organic material that had settled into the bottom of the bubbling springs. Because what happens when you have charcoal, it doesn't, it's really hard, it doesn't dissolve. But this organic black mat, when it's treated before it's sent to be radiocarbonated, it dissolved. So that's how they determined well, that, that it was not actually charcoal, that it was organic material that had oxidized because charcoal will not dissolve in this solution that they use, but this organic mat does. Because this opened a bunch of other opportunities around the monument in the surrounding area, including some of my own stuff today. So what was next? In 1979, Tule Springs became listed as a national, on the National Registry of Historic Places due to its understanding of paleo environments, and the first wide-scale use of radiocarbon dating in an archaeological context in this type of setting. There were field schools led by Dr. Kevin Raffey, uh, college community, the Community Colleges of the Nevada, now CSN. And there's also been lots of surveys done for compliance, for right-of-ways, roads, fences, housing developments. It's kind of crazy how close the South Unit is, is to uh, some housing developments uh, down there. We're constantly working with the developers to figure out how to work together. What can be found there today? So as I mentioned earlier, some of the best examples of mammoth, Pleistocene horse, camelid, direwolf, giant American lion, saber-toothed cat, llama, bison, and giant ground sloth examples have been found here. We have full intact tusks from the mammoth. It's kind of, they're really heavy. They're really cool to look at. Archaeological sites include rock rings, lithics, ceramics, hearths, short-term occupation sites. In historic, site, historic sites, we had the railroad uh, with the wagon trails. The expedition is now considered historic because it's over 50 years old. And a World War II gunnery range and school, which I didn't know about, which is kind of interesting. Here's a breakdown of the type of sites we have at Tulane Springs that are prehistoric. We have lithic scatters, mixed artifact scatters, features, which include the rock rings and things like that. Uh, scattering of both prehistoric and historic features with multiple multi-components and some sites where we have paleontological fossils as well as artifacts. And then just single stationary, just one off either a historic can or a historic lithic somewhere or a prehistoric lithic, excuse me. These are actually pictures from my, the work I've been doing. These are both, one's a rock ring and one's a clay depression. The rock ring and the, these are both probably indications of short-term occupation where they cleared the land or made a hearth 
or just a place to lay down and sleep for the night. We have an actual hearth. These are kind of blurry. These are old photos. Sorry about that. There's a rock shelter and a hearth. So historic sites. We have historic artifacts scatter, which I actually just found another one a couple days ago. So I got to get that going. Uh, historic features, historic roads, railroads, and historic with paleological resources. So here's some more. Um, the first photo is the Tony Springs Expedition Base Camp. You can actually see the clear land still where the, where the tents were set up for the expedition. And these are the trenches now. They've been kind of filling back in with sediment from water and wind and the slumping because of erosion. And you can see in the middle photo how close the development actually is to the big dig site. There you go. Sorry, my light is being weird. So here's, there's a railroad that ran through the Tonopah, Las Vegas Tonopah Railroad. And there's also a Tonopah Bullfrog, I believe. And there's a map of where the railroad came through and per the wagon, the wag, the rat, that, excuse me, the wagon tra trail road now. You can still see the ruts of the wagons in the, where the plants are at. The monument today. We have a lot of projects going on at one time. It's kind of crazy. We have lots of stuff going on. We, I'm currently doing archeological an archeology span survey and site documentation. We have a paleontologist doing the same thing. They're doing plant inventories because we have um, the Las Vegas bear poppy, which is a endangered species that, that is all over the South unit. We have some ex wild, uh, there's birds that are, birds and tortoises that are endangered as well that live in Cooley Springs. We're trying to restore native plants. We have a bunch of public programs, park ranger, mounted horse patrol, the site stewardship program, Night Skies and Junior Ranger programs. And there's always new planning of trails and development of interpretive material, all kinds of, it's a new park, we have a lot to do. And this is some of the outreach stuff that we have done. Uh, we've done parades, we've done digital virtual field trips, monitoring of different things. We actually have a weed removal tomorrow, National Fossil Day, we're doing Pleistocene Palooza, which we'll have live animals compared to the Pleistocene counterparts, which should be cool. And of course, public presentations like the one I have now. This was the volunteer mounted horse patrol parade for the July parade. The mounted horse patrol is documenting horsebacking, horseback riding trails and giving us back data to see where these trails are so we can actually make permanent trails for them so they're not walking over known sites and damaging cultural or natural resources. And also reporting any kind of suspicious activities to us or the park rangers. This is our park rangers. Bark stands for bag your pet's waste, always on a leash, respect wildlife and know where you can go. This is to help people with their dogs and just to recreate safely with the dogs because there are snakes out here and pet waste does detrimentally affect the soil and the park itself, not just visually, but in other ways. And my light keeps going out. This is a traveling exhibit that was at Nevada State Museum. It is now in storage and it's going to go to um, the Natural History Museum sometime next month. There's one of the tusks I was talking about that is really big and really heavy. It's, a, it's complete. This exhibit also includes uh, a baby mammoth jaw, a camel jaw, a mammoth tooth, and a horse tooth. This whole thing comes apart and it gets moved around and shipped around to different places. We actually just moved this one from Las Vegas to Red Rock. Stop going out of me. Okay, my life at, at Tule Springs. My life at, here is pretty crazy. I'm currently, what I was hired to do is condition assessment reports for archaeological sites and redocumenting to bring everything up to current standards. There hasn't been a lot of archaeological research done here since the big dig, 
because it's not a lot there and people don't find it all that interesting but there is some cool stuff there so because of this some of my sites have been even documented haven't even been visited in like 40 years so trying to relocate them especially on a floodplain is challenging but it's fun i'm recreating maps photos gps locations access routes and site forms I'm also doing public outreach to presentation and events. I'll be at the Great Basin Archaeological Conference as well as I'll be tomorrow for the Reader Angle and all kinds of stuff. And as I showed the traveling exhibit before, I'm also building a database for the cultural resources that we do have them have at have at the monument. If you want to get involved, uh, being involved with the Natural Historic with the Chippewa Office is great. Archaea Nevada. Nevada Archaeological Association, so the Nevada Rock Rock Formation, such as Tule Springs. Any volunteering is greatly appreciated at Tule Springs or anywhere else because we're always short staff and always need more people to help. It, this, it's never ending job and there's always something to do no matter how small it is. It always helps. And that is the end of my presentation. Thank you all for listening. Right. <clears throat> Tina, thank you so much. Um, I have a couple questions. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Okay, awesome. So um, let's see, which one are we gonna go with first? So we had a question, did lithics improve over time? For example, are later arrowheads sharper, stronger than earlier examples? Yes and no, they do change over time and change during region. It also, it depends on what they were hunting. During like in Europe, they were bigger, more sturdy ones. And here, especially in Nevada, in Southern Nevada, there wasn't a lot of large game, especially recently. So they had a lot of small finer points and they're still sharp no matter how tiny they are, but they do get a little more advanced, especially with how they have them to the arrows or the spearheads. All right, we had a, another question. Um, what is the relationship of the monument to the, I might say this wrong, England, Englington Preserve directly adjacent on the Southeast border? Do you know anything about that? I do. The Eglinton Preserve is actually being uh, taken care of by Tule Springs now. The Eglinton Preserve is a very weird, jagged area that is full of Las Vegas bear poppy. We are working with the developer to uh, make it so his developing of the houses will not impact the bear poppy negatively because it's it is an endangered species and it's only found here. Hope that answered your question. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I had a, a question in the chat box. What is the relationship of the Ice Age Museum next door to the monument? Because there's like a state park. And yeah, then the... Yes, the Ice Age Fossil State Park. They, uh, they are surrounded on three sides by Tule Springs. They are, se they are both separate and a part of us. They have maintenance mostly over a lot of the big they maintain most of the big dig, the big dig trenches. Tulip Springs has some of them, but they take uh, control of a lot of them and they maintain them. And they're doing, uh, they're working right now on a volunteer center where we'll have an office there for our interpretive park guide to work out of that office. So we do work closely with them because our stuff does overlap. That's amazing. And I know uh, that is also so new for them too. Um, I worked in the same building when they were getting the building put up and, you know, they don't, I don't think they have interp too much interp in the building at this time. And, uh, you know, there's all kinds of things to come. Yeah. As right. far as I know, they're still building it and our, we just hired a park guy for Tule Springs. So she'll have an office down there. So it'll be nice to have somebody closer instead of us being all in Boulder city. Right. And so there was a question, is there a visitor center? So there is going to be a visitor center, but it's through state parks, right? Uh, it'll be, I say state park will have one. We're still working on whether or not Tule Springs is going to have one because we have so many competing parks around us. We had Ice Age Fossil State Park. We had the, we have Corn Creek. 
uh, Las Vegas Wild, the Wildlife Refuge. So we're actually trying to fund and figure out if we can do a research center instead, which will be a place to house fossils, research materials. And so people like me or future researchers can come and have a place to research instead of doing it wherever they where the things are at. Because our stuff is all scattered to the winds right now because it's been, uh, fossils have been taken all over the country. So we're trying to get them all back, but we don't have a place to put them yet. So we're trying to get that research center so we can. Okay, um, here's a uh, related question in a way. How difficult or easy is it to deal with the housing developers near the site? Some are amazing, some are a little more difficult. <laughs> the Eglinton Preserve people, uh, I don't remember which development that is, but he is a little difficult to work with, but we do have an area we call the Golden Triangle. With the, and it's between uh, the Paiute Golf Course and Tule Springs. So that developer is actually going to make trailheads into the park for us and give us access to parks that he's gonna make with pavilions for us to use for our outreach programs. That's fantastic partnerships and, and I think that's really great. Um, so there's a question, is the preserve open to the public now? I don't believe it is because we're still doing surveys out there. Mm -hmm. um, we're still trying to figure out, as far as I know, it's not open to the public. Right, I think the state park um, has some trails set up. Um, so, um, I can't see what, Gail, uh, you might want to check with the state park and see if you can't, you know, experience the area, but through there, because they have established trails at this time. I know they have also cameras that they're watching because a lot of the public um, go into undesignated areas and they were having a hard time with um, people on dirt bikes and stuff riding in places where it's, you know, because they were used to doing it, now it's taken over, you know, and being preserved. And so they were not following the rules. Um, so I know that is something that, that they were working on there. Um, all right, I have another question. Has the storm drain project been finished near the south entrance into the monument? Are you aware of that? I believe they're still working on that one. Okay. I think I got everybody's questions in the chat so far. I'm not familiar with the site, but are there still springs or any water? Uh, there's some of that Corn Creek. There's really no, I mean, it's part of the upper Las Vegas wash, so it does get water periodically. It's a floodplain, but I don't, as far as I know, there's no active springs there anymore because of all the groundwater pumping. It's kind of like how the Springs Reserve no longer really has active springs. It's been drained. But Corn Creek, which is north, and north and east, I believe, does still have active springs. Yeah, I think Corn Creek is a, a great place to go. Um, and if you keep your eye out on as you're driving up and you see the white little hills, that's the same kind of um, environment. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, so here we have a question. Uh, do the fossil footprints found in New Mexico recently make scientists rethink whether humans did exist here with the large mammals at Tule Springs. I don't know about person, like everybody else, but I find it exciting. Um, it would be interesting to see if we can find more evidence at Tule Springs of that. So I just heard about that recently and I was really excited to see that they actually have proof now. But unfortunately with Tule Springs, we have to do more excavation to try to prove that at least at Thule, but because of the nature of the soil and the floodplain, it's kind of hard to establish if things are where they were when they were deposited because the water action and the spring action, I'm hoping it brings out more interest to Thule Springs so we can get some more funding and get some more research done out there, but we'll see what the future brings. Well, thank you, Tina. Um... I really appreciate you bringing all that information to us. I learned a lot. I thought I already knew quite a bit about what was going on out there. And it's nice to see um, your work that you're doing and, and getting all that re-recorded and documented so it can be preserved. So we really appreciate it. Thank you, Thank you. this was fun. Okay. Oh, hang on, real quick. I said bye, but um, if, if they're out there hiking uh, in the area and they discover a fossil, should they contact you?
yeah uh let us know let the park ranger know let somebody know and if you can gps it to the best of your ability like if you have the avenza map or google maps just try to pinpoint exactly what's at and let somebody know it may or may not be um one of our sites already but if it's not then we can go out there and document it and get it taken care of so yeah if you find anything out there fossils or anything that arrowheads pottery anything that is historic or prehistoric or paleological, just let us know. Yeah, and if um, you need Tina's contact information, um, Jim, I'm not sure if you're a site steward, I can't see your last name. Uh, you can always send that to Samantha Rubinson at Stewardship Program. You can send it to me and we'll make sure that they get it and, and or we can give you their contact information directly. 